Welcome back to Vonk Radio. Radio Vonk, made by the Volt Movement. Welcome back, everybody, on this beautiful sunny day. I hope you're all listening and you're ready for some nice content because we have Matthew here, Matthew Longo, already introduced himself before the break, so we can actually dive right into it. Welcome to all listeners. Matthew, so tell us a bit more about your day-to-day work, please. Yeah, sure. So I, um, my specialization is in borders. I should give a little bit of a, um, a background of how I got to this subject. You know, borders are now uh, very sexy as a topic. It's a thing that's in the news. But uh, I started thinking about them and working on them about 10, almost, wow, 12 years now uh, ago when it was much less in the news uh, because there was a lot less of this, uh, you know, current concern about immigration and a lot of less, less concern about uh, the ways in which the, the nation state is vulnerable than we have today. And so I got into the project actually in a way I think a lot of um, academic projects begin, which is I had spent some time uh, as a normal person traveling the world, but also traveling um, and crossing borders and thinking, God, this is an interesting experience where you see so much of uh, life's drama play out of people being excluded and included and, you know, people crying, people having visas denied, people having, being taken to secondary, being interrogated. I mean, borders really are political interaction points. And I uh, went to graduate school and I ended up finding that in graduate texts, borders tend to be more legal conceptions, right? They're more uh, thin jurisdictional lines. And I thought, okay, well, that didn't accord with what I lived through. I was experiencing borders where people were screaming and crying and events were happening, politics was happening. And instead, I looked at the books, and the books were telling me that borders are these thin lines where states stop and start. And so I got interested in that as a question for politics and for philosophy, for thinking about what a state is, where states really do stop and start what really happens at these institutions. And so anyways, this is what got me into the subject and turned into a career. So I wrote this book about um, borders and uh, talk a little bit about the expertise that comes out of it uh, in very, very brief. The idea is that borders, uh, when thought of as thin jurisdictional lines, end up masking the kinds of politics that take place. And to really to begin to be able to ask questions about what a border is and what a border does and why we should care, you um, have to go and you have to talk to people. I actually spent years interviewing. Um, at the time, it was mostly American. This has sort of expanded in my professional life. Uh, border guards, border makers, people who are professionally tasked with standing on the line or checking passports, but also the people designing them, designing the fanciest drones or, you know, the newest technologies. I went to uh, tech expos where people are, where the state is selling its newest cameras and uh, the uh, the engineers are saying, what kind of camera should we design, right? So the state is saying, is asking basically the question, uh, what would be a perfect border? And the engineers are saying, here's how we can help you make it. And so that process, you know, the the sausage making process of politics, uh, got me really interested. And ultimately that began in the desert lands of Arizona, but became a bro- broader broader project, let's say, about the world, because ultimately that same sausage making um, uh, experience takes place everywhere. So that's what got me interested. And therefore that kind of gives a little bit of a baseline of what uh, I can maybe bring to this discussion about Europe beyond borders as a subject in the sense that um, you know, now borders are a subject again because of COVID, because of the coronavirus, and people are interested in, you know, what actually is happening at these institutions, uh, a lot of uh, which were invisible in certain ways for people. Um, so anyway, that's why, that's why I'm here, and that's what my expertise can perhaps bring uh, to this conversation. Thank you for this explanation. Yeah. So. Um, One of the things I was wondering, in uh, your book, The Politics of Borders, you um, discuss the idea of co-bordering and um, that would create heterogeneous sovereignty. I even have a hard time pronouncing it, let alone understanding it. It's a mouthful. So maybe you can can, uh, explain to me what the idea of co-bordering is and what heterogeneous sovereignty is. <laughs> sure. Heterogeneous. Uh, I, will, I will say that uh, academic books and academic writing is often better read than spoken out loud. And the first time I did a book reading when I went on a book tour, I also was finding myself avoiding passages <laughs> that had really long words because, you know, it's really ugly to say these words. You know, that you write them because there's something precise, right, yeah. about the, the content. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, you can get lost in them. So 
Um, They're like tongue twisters. Yeah, uh, completely. Yeah, yeah, and you get and it's also it's a doubly embarrassing when you're the one who's supposed to be the the mm -hmm. expert on the subject and you can't even say the word. You feel like an idiot. Um, I'm not an idiot. I promise. Uh, I uh, okay. So heterogeneous sovereignty means and co-bordering means that uh, we have this idea, this sort of nation-state model, uh, that's in a way obviously and always simplistic. It's not like we everybody ever thought that uh, states were really purely containers. This idea that there's a, a polity bounded by a border. Uh, if you think on a map, this is sort of the most classic cartographic way in which a border is represented. This idea that there's a line and there's a, think of the map, you have country A is red and country B is, you know, yellow and the line in the middle. When in fact, we all know that, of course, a little bit of red sneaks into yellow, whether it's because of language or religion or nationhood, etc. And so anyways, the, the, the model is always a little bit off. We've always known it was off, which interestingly, coming back to Volt for a moment, uh, is precisely what's fascinating about thinking about pan-European conceptions. Because in a way, a model like Volt can help fix the kind of failures of the sovereignty model we expect. But uh, I wanted to interrogate what exactly that messiness looked like, because we can think often in the language that nation crosses borders. But we don't think of sovereignty that way. We think of states as having fairly perfectly tight sovereign domains. There's a sovereign unit, a territory, that matches onto sovereignty. In fact, uh, borders don't work that way either, and states don't work that way. What happens is borders, even, even the most uh, hard borders, think of like, you know, the big ugly wall between the U.S. and Mexico, these kind of uh, almost uh, comic book versions of a tight closed border. Uh, ultimately end up being very wide or thick spaces with lots of different kinds of state collaboration, mm -hmm. including uh, joint policing and joint intelligence. And there are actually zones where the state or sovereignty looks a lot like nationhood or language, things that spill over. And therefore, oh, to understand the state, yeah. you have to think of the model differently. So when you say, so co-bordering is where these zones, these fat zones occur, mm. and heterogeneous sovereignty is a way of describing these zones that have essentially two sovereigns. Yeah. Interesting, and how big do those zones tend to be? Well, uh, that's a huge question, and actually, when you get into the question of political philosophy or to ethics, and you sort of think about what would make um, a just logic around bordering, that question of what exactly uh, is the domain of the border is a huge one. So in part, of course the concern, if you're local, if you sit at a border, if you live at a border, you know, the area I knew best and did most of my field work was a place called Nogales, Arizona. Uh, but frankly, any border town in any part of the world um, is going to have a certain kind of ways in which the border impacts your life. And maybe we can accept that. Maybe we can buy into the fact that if you live in the little border town, the border will ultimately uh, cover over your world. Mm -hmm. But increasingly, the model of the border town is now everywhere, right? Part of the problem of the present is that bordering extends all throughout the polity. And uh, so in, in a way, that is the question, right? Because even if I were to tell you there's this, there's this complicated and possibly, uh, you know, um, undesirable, let's say, way in which the state is expanding its powers at the border, maybe even you or a person who is very anti-immigration and very into protectionist economic policies, they might say, you know what, that's the best way to do it. Mm. The best way to do it is to have these, these uh, totally protected thick borders that are basically security zones, which to me sounds like a hellscape. But maybe for them they think it's perfect. The problem is, is that once you start thinking that's okay, the border just gets bigger and bigger. And all the kinds of protections and all the kinds of, uh, you know, dubious legal, le legal provisions that happen at borders and the ways in which security becomes uh, triumphant over, security becomes parasitic over rights uh -huh. at the border yeah. is ultimately happening everywhere. Yeah. And so the concern is that we don't start to uh, identify that and then, and then, you know, start to regulate it or stop it or whatever. So the point is, your question's literally precisely the right one. I mean, it's the, it's the, yeah. it's the issue. Yeah. And, and just uh, for me to, to be clear, we're talking here about borders and we're talking about people, right? Um, because uh, if I travel, for example, to the United States, I come to an airport and uh, I go through what's called immigration, then I have a next sort of fence to cross, which is called customs. So 
is that also part of that domain that you are describing, you know, where actually they ask me uh, if I enter the United States, they will double check my suitcase, you know, yeah, uh, am I not bringing in uh, food or agricultural products? Uh, is this part of the domain that you are describing as well? Or is yeah, completely. No, and in fact, so uh, to go back to thinking about what a border is in, in a conceptual way, you know, uh, I had talked a little bit about the problems of the sort of cartographic model Mm -hmm. about thinking in this very simple way where a border is a thin line and countries are different. Another version of this problem is this idea that borders are always the same in all parts. In fact, an airport might be an international border in the middle of a country. It might have yeah. nothing to do with a geographical border. Yeah. And in fact, a border itself, usually when you say the border, you actually think of. Like if I asked you to think of a border, you'd think of the perimeter, the thin line. Yeah. But what you're describing is a port of entry, right? So an airport, a seaport, a land yeah, bar or yeah. ports of entry. But they're different institutions. And we throw them together in our talk as though it's the same thing, when actually it's a, it's a meaningless way to speak. So for example, if I, uh, you think about how much time you talk about um, tough borders and uh, like a good border is a wall. And then you, that's a kind of very kind of um, classic exclusionary language. And then the classic inclusionary language is the borders like a bridge. Okay. Hmm. They're completely meaningless metaphors because every border is going to have a perimeter that's always going to be a little wall-like, even if it's not wall-ish. There's not like entrances everywhere. And every port is going to be a little bit bridge-like in the sense that even like North Korea lets some people in, right? And the most closed states open for some. So the question is not wall or bridge. The question is how do we create a just policy to manage those processes? What gets interrogated? How? Right? And so ex this is exactly the point. I, too many people, I think, would ask the question you have, which is a perfect question, right? This experience that you're going through at an airport doesn't sound like the experience of like the wall and the US Mexico wall, but it's precisely the same conversation. Yeah, it's interesting. It's that our language has blocked us yeah. from yeah. thinking that way a little bit. Yeah, 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 interesting. So another question that came up uh, in my head is, um, let me start with a small story. I once uh, gave a presentation about uh, Volt and what we are trying to achieve with Europe. And then uh, somebody asked the question, do you want it to be like the United States of America in terms of the cooperative model? Right. And then uh, I gave an answer and afterwards a former minister who was like 80 years old <laughs> came up to me and said, young man, the answer you gave, bullshit. <laughs> Bullshit. Because, and, and I quote him, because the European Union and the way they collaborate is uh, an entirely unique collaboration and where people tend to believe that the United States are way closer together, often the uh, borders between states can have stronger regulatory manners when, when it comes to transportation of products across state borders Alcohol. than, yeah, for example, <laughs> yeah. than in uh, Europe. And so the internal market in Europe is way further integrated, supposedly, than yeah. the United States. Mm. Um, and there were some other aspects to that as well. So why am I telling this story? Yeah. I'm curious, can you make a comparison of how you perceive the borders within the EU versus the borders between states in the United States? Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, the short answer, I'll give, give you two answers. Um, one is to say, uh, I don't know nearly enough about that with precision, that question about the fluidity of the internal market? That's a terrific question. Uh, and you've now made me think I should know the answer to that question, but I don't actually. And so mm -hmm. I shouldn't speak to that. But what I should speak to um, is this question of internal boundaries uh, is so fascinating because again, back to the simplistic idea of a border, the border is the thing preventing country A and country B from either people or armies or whatever you want to keep out of your country at, at the external limit, the frontier. And, but of course we know that within polities, there are always internal boundaries. It need not be as official as a member state, like in Europe, or as a state, as in the US. It's often just regions and districts, et cetera. But one of the fascinating experiences for me about living through COVID, living through the coronavirus, is that immediately all of these internal borders that nobody really knew about yeah. became visible. So all these invisible borders became visible. And I think that in, when I think forward, uh, one of the great opportunities this affords us, now that these borders are becoming visible, the strictures of where the state's able to stop you from going, 
is exactly the moment you can start to say, okay, what's a rational policy for managing those controls? Because if you're concerned about civil rights and civil liberties, uh, you should be concerned that there are these borders you don't know you're crossing every day, but if the state wants to, it can tighten. And one of the experiences about, that's interesting about Europe is when I found out that within Europe, Borders were reestablishing themselves, right? There's the there's the coronavirus has in a way temporarily upended Schengen, right? You yeah. can't cross at borders, okay? Uh, my first reaction is to say this is obvious. It is obvious this is the way. Whether you think it's good, separate question, but it's obvious the way the nation state would handle it. And uh, it didn't bother me when I heard about Europe per se, because ultimately Europe has been uh, very involved in the idea of preserving sovereignty among member, member states. And I realize this is something that Volt wants to upend, and that's good, as you might, but the fact that Volt even exists is a statement of saying that the sure. member states retain in a way too much power. Yes. Doesn't surprise me. I was actually floored about the ways in which it was happening in the US. Because in the U.S., we have, of course, the opposite way of seeing it. Again, I have no idea about the facticity of how yeah. open the markets are. But the idea that there would be border controls between New Jersey and Pennsylvania, for example, really blew my mind. Yeah. Because I have never thought about the states this way. And uh, part of this is just the way the news hits us. We all react differently. We're always not always prepared for the way things happen. I was a bit surprised. It took me by surprise. Yeah. Um, the fact that there were restrictions didn't surprise me. It's that state lines were asserted, right? Yeah. It's not restrictions. Um, but in particular, part of the reason is that for those of us that care a lot about boundaries, the question of when and how states create internal restrictions is really, really important. It isn't something that should be haphazard. And uh, to give you a little bit of background on it, because I know that the member state model is familiar in Europe, right? I mean, it's not... Yeah. Uh, no European doesn't know that there is a Germany and there's a France, even if the border's open, right? Yes. And yet, if you ask an American about internal state borders, the answer is there aren't any. No one's ever known them. You literally would never even know unless there was like a little road sign that you crossed a state line. The welcome whole logic, Arizona. the whole, yeah. there's a welcome to Arizona sign, exactly. Yeah. And there are things that are made fun of. Like, for example, the New Yorker had a comic I love, uh, which is this open highway in the middle of nowhere uh, that just says, like, imagine nothing for the whole amount the eye can see, and a tiny little road, and a tiny little sign that says, welcome to Texas, and underneath it, last vegan pizza for 4,000 miles, <laughs> right? I mean, the idea that there would be like a border control, it's, it's, it's made up, it's completely unimagined. There isn't even a gas station, right? So yeah. the idea that those are closing is shocking, but uh, in the American imaginary, it's because they don't exist. But in fact, historically, for those of us that are border geeks, right? Yeah. Those that care about borders a lot. How many uh, are there in the world, do you think, of border geeks? <laughs> oh, hey, hey, hey. There's a lot of border geeks right now. Border is a sexy topic to be geeky about. Really? Um, there's, uh, there's, there's a whole border, there's a whole borderlands association. My God, we're like, um, oh. uh, there's, there are border journals. No, there's oh. a whole, there, there, are, there are border conventions. You have no oh. idea. Oh. Uh, in fact, one of, my, entire world in itself. one of my favorite, um, one of my favorite ways of describing this is that um, if you were imagining where, how the world border academic association would get together, right? The Borderlands Conference for the, for the world. Yeah. Uh, of course, what you would do is you'd have it in two cities with the border in the middle. And so what happens is we go to one city, there are talks, and then there's a day of excursion to the border, and then we go to the other city and have talks. So um, I did this uh, every year. The every four years is this world convention. And which cities did the, you go so to? The last time was uh, was between Budapest and Vienna, across the border, and the time before that was between a uh, town in Finland, Joensu, and Saint Petersburg in Russia. Oh yeah. And um, but it's it's a uh, it's a whole culture. And in yeah. fact, I should say that uh, I'm very indebted to this geekery world because at the last conference. Uh, I went to was at the Hungarian Austrian border. I ended up going to the border and meeting people. And ultimately I have a new book project that's based entirely on the experience at that border, which if you read the book is about the border, the book that will, I will write. That's not existing. Oh, yet, the next yet. book. Uh, but in fact, what you don't know is the backstory that the only reason I even went to this border or thought about it at all is because there was this border geek conference that I attended. <laughs> Okay. What will that yeah. book be about? It, about borders, of course. Uh, but it's about the last days of the Iron Curtain, and okay. it's about the actually the first tear in the curtain, which we think of the 
fall of the, of the East through the language of the Berlin Wall, actually the Berlin Wall is in a way not the last step, but one of the last steps. Yeah, it yeah. began earlier, but the story of how it began, how a border de-instantiated, right? Think of how much we think about borders going up right now. We think of like, you know, yeah. building walls. Yeah. But the ways in which a border disappears is such an interesting story. Yeah. And it was one that I had never really thought about. Again, you know, it's very humbling <laughs> academia in this way that you think you're like an expert on a subject and then yeah. a question ar arises to you that's so obvious. Yeah. We ask all the time, how do borders get built up? We never ask how they come down. <laughs> so suddenly here I feel like an, an idiot again, or at least unprepared for my it, subject. It, it often happens to specialists, I believe, that the more you know, the more you know, you, you know very little. Precisely. Well, also, and to go back to the internal borders thing, yeah. when I first learned that they were shutting down the state borders, it's like, they're doing what? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> kind of, yeah, you know, you're, yeah. But then you think about it. Um, and actually, to, so to answer your question, to go back to your question, um, the actual answer I was going to give about the internal state borders, if you're a border geek, right, the, and you know a little bit about the way the U.S. Federation developed, etc., internal state borders have always been a way in which the, the states have used their boundaries to keep people they didn't want in or didn't want out, sorry, to keep people in or out based on whether they wanted them. And so, for example, uh, the poor, certainly people who are uh, black or brown, people of different races and different religions, uh, states have often kept, used different kinds of border controls in very nefarious ways. These are things we think about in the 19th century in the U.S., up through the 1960s, but we don't think about it anymore. The question of the internal border in the U.S. just ended. It's not a thing ever talked about. But it was absolutely true. If you wanted to come into California and you were on a train and you were poor, you would be stopped on the train and sent back. This was not a strange occurrence because they thought you were going to flood their labor market. And the history of what Americans have done in racial politics is familiar. We know how mm -hmm. perverse uh, the relationship of the white majority to its minority populations is in the U.S. It's a familiar story. But it's a familiar story mostly in the language of civil rights or lynching or slavery, this, this long history. But the question of border controls is not that familiar. So actually, to, come, to bring this back to the subject of internal boundaries and the European-American comparison, the truth is, is that the concern is not that internal boundaries are reasserted in Europe. It's that when they reassert themselves, they end up becoming a way in which Europe performs certain kinds of politics by other means. Meaning, uh, people start to create boundaries around who they think is desirable to let in. Mm. Right? So Europe went from being open to being closed. Fine. Temporary. COVID. Understandable. The concern is that when they reopen, it'll start to become a little bit selective. And yeah. it'll be based on who's desirable, desirable how, based on what conditions, determined how and this is a really painful road that in the u.s thankfully we had gotten past at one point and i'm concerned for the u.s that it's going to uh yeah. reoccur in that way but i think the same thing is true here so we have to use the knowledge from your second book in order to make sure that when these uh, when the COVID uh, crisis is over we do not uphold those borders uh, and do not have such a selection process before uh, people can enter. I think I would say, it's, uh, yes, I would say <coughs> slightly differently. I would say that the concern, because uh, it's not, the, the second book is totally different. It's about like the 80s and freedom and uh, the transition from communism to capitalism. It, no, this is much more the, the first book. This is much more the mm. book project where the kinds of ways there are distinctions at borders that are very uh, ethically dubious about who gets in and out, <clears throat> maybe, maybe we can find some kind of logic because of self-determination, some kind of claim we can make that it's okay at the border. But the moment that starts happening internally, where desirability becomes a determinant of travel, we are completely lost as a society. Mm. And that's, that's the topic of the first book. It's just that the first book talks about it at the border, whereas this is saying, actually, it's now looking at the member state border, not the <clears throat> EU border, so, so to speak. Yeah. So, um, uh, very interesting. So, your concept and, and, and the politics of borders, it reminds me of this phenomenon, and it might not pertain to Europe, but maybe it could, this gerrymandering. The mm. whole issue of gerrymandering in the U.S., where you, uh, 
decide to replace your border for political purpose. Yeah. Is this something that uh, could happen in Europe as well? Or um, yeah. tell me about that. Yeah, well, I, so that's uh, it's interesting. So gerrymandering is the most... Maybe we should explain a little bit what gerrymandering is. Yes, uh, I, I don't yeah, know if that's fair. That's fair, huh? Yes, yeah. yes. Okay, yes. good. No, 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 that's good. So um, gerrymandering in this sense is just the ways in which, uh, uh, in, at least in the example that I know better, which is in the, in the U.S., the ways in which, for example, uh, house districts, the districts by which you'd get elected, let's say, to the U.S. Congress, uh, are drawn in such a way to guarantee certain kind of political ends. And it's the most visible way borders are used to manipulate politics. So, for example, uh, if let's say you have a really uh, dubious political agenda and you would like to make it so that uh, black voters in your state have almost no representation, what you would do is you'd make it so all the black voters are in one district and they have one representative And the other, let's say you're, you have 50 districts in your state, the other 49 districts become white with yeah. tiny black minorities. Mm -hmm. So then you mm -hmm. have, rather than a state that's largely or hugely multiracial, you have basically no representation, just based on where you drew the lines. The gerrymandered border is fascinating for me as someone that thinks about borders because it's the most visible example of the border determining politics. And I like it in that sense as a, as, a, as a metaphor, like its metaphorical structure is helpful because it shows how the visible case alerts us to all the invisible ones. Yeah, exactly. Right? So, for example, to bring it to Europe. Are there many invisible cases? Oh, my God. I think most boundaries are invisible. I think most boundaries to most people, unless you are literally stopped by some big guy with a gun, you don't notice. And Europe's a little bit different in this way because the... Uh, the history of the nation is so robust. Yeah. Everybody knows where the border is. It's like you don't yeah. randomly end up like, oh my God, I'm in Belgium. Like <laughs> you know where no, Holland never stops. To me, no. It, no, precisely. And actually, uh, so it's it's aware. But again, it's only the national border in Europe. All these other kinds of borders. So, for example, uh, since I'm apparently talking about Holland and Belgium, we can keep mm -hmm. on this subject. Uh, you might argue that the most meaningful boundary of Belgium is where Wallonia ends, right? The idea mm. of where the Flemish area ends. That's the linguistic border. border and the national border don't match at all, yeah. right? In fact, they're explicitly in different places. And uh, this, of course, has a long history of yeah. war and religion and leaving yeah. out all the messiness. Much more simply put, there's a ling linguistic boundary and a national boundary that don't accord. When that happens around the world... I actually don't know much about how this works inside Belgium, but just to talk about it for a moment, as though I did, because I think it's an example that um, does replicate worldwide. There ends up being lots of different kinds of boundaries. In this case, the way language is policed, where schooling districts would happen, where p postal offices yes. would happen. There's lots of boundaries based on whether it's history, whether it's religion, whether it's language. Yeah. You'd have to spend time to determine exactly where the invisible lines are. Yeah. Basically, especially a place like Europe that has so much history, but also so much bloody history of wars and demarcations. And I mean, European history is, is, is riddled with all these lines that are no longer existing, yeah. but they linger for some reason. Yeah. And now the most classic example of this is, is East-West Germany. I mean, it's the most because the border was the freshest. Yeah. It's also because it's what I'm now thinking about. It's on my mind. I now think a lot about the old Cold War boundaries Uh, this distinction of East and West is one that was replaced. It was papered over, right? It was a papered over border. But borders don't just stop existing, right? They just stop being represented, in this case, on maps. Yeah. Uh, which begins the question of, which is interesting, which is then how do these invisible lines shape our lives, shape our politics? And to come back to gerrymandering, gerrymandering is the most uh, visible version of this kind of politics. But in fact, it's everywhere. And mm. to really spend time, for example, in the inter-German border, to learn about how those old borders are being used for contemporary politics, how they're being manipulated, mm. is a huge subject. Yeah. But it's not the next book. <laughs> it's the third book. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's interesting. interesting. It reminds me of the 30 year celebration of the fall of the Berlin Wall that we had in November last year. Um, I'm also 30 years old, so um, for me, Europe has always been a given because yeah. two months after I was born, the Berlin Wall fell. But when they um, talked a lot about how how's the situation now, there were so many divisions still between what is going on in East Germany yes. and in uh, former East Germany, former West Germany, so that although the border has, uh, has gone away 30 mm. years later, you still see that there's some invisible border. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, so this, this new project I've begun, you know, I'm living in Europe. I wanted to start a European project. I'm here. It interests me. Uh, obviously, my last book was mostly US-centric because I was in the US. It's just the way projects occur because you inhabit the world you're in in a yeah. certain way. I wanted to be about Europe, and this project began as a Hungary project. But actually, the story of East-West Germany, uh, every year, every month that I'm developing this argument, gets more and more interesting. Because I was one of those people that also didn't really think very hard about East and West Germany. It was just Germany is a place. And yeah. it was not a place I knew very well. It wasn't a place I specialized in. So in that sense, it just existed. And all the uncovering of how meaningful the, you know, the Easter, Wester distinction is, the aussie Westy distinction, how much it turns into electoral politics, to go back to gerrymandering, the question of, for example, where the IF day is uh, big, is big yeah. but also the question of where COVID cases are. All of it's linked to these different kinds of lines. And... Uh, Oh, it's incredibly fascinating. I, yeah. So the point is that you taking it for granted need not be about your age, right? I think it also, in, uh -huh. in a way, the fact that I, I don't come from Europe aids yeah. in that. I would say most of the world has not ever thought, or certainly not ever thought critically about, the ways in which German reunification was a papering over of lines, right? It was the pretending that lines didn't matter that actually still continue to matter which of course only lets you ask the question of how and why, right? But I actually, I, I, I fell into that trap also. And I think that most countries have this. You know, you have that here a little bit. I really, I shouldn't talk about Holland. I don't know Holland very well. And I feel very weird talking about Holland on Dutch Volt Radio. Um, <laughs> because, Go ahead. Because I really, I don't know it very well. But frankly, uh, the, the distinctions you get a little bit now of the old Catholic Protestant yes. lines. And the question of, you know, the culture of a place like Brabant or Limburg, the way it's talked about, and the way it's talked about the, the story of what is Holland versus what is the Netherlands, oh, yeah. all of these are kinds of lines. Yeah. And again, when I moved here, I didn't realize that Holland and the Netherlands were not the same place. I thought they were literally two synonyms. Like if you called one the US and you called one America, they were literally the same place. Mm. It like... Again, back to the question of like, yeah. what's surprise about living in Europe? <laughs> yeah. The fact that somebody was a student in a in a the division I by was the a rivers. student in like mm -hmm. my first um, seminar I taught at Leiden. I said something about Holland, and she corrected me. Neither. She said, "No, you're not talking about you're not talking about you're talking about the Netherlands." Yeah. That actually she was asserting a distinction between the Holland part of the Netherlands, the Holland identity in the Netherlands, mm -hmm. as opposed mm -hmm. to where she was from, which I then learned was Brabant, and I learned a little bit what that meant. And but. Uh, you know, Holland is not a country you think of as internally divided, right? This is not Germany yeah. that reunified in yeah. our lifetimes. Yeah. This is, this is one polity. Yeah. And the, the interesting yeah. thing is, is that it occurs on so many levels as well. I mean, if you zoom in uh, into, into the Netherlands, you see different provinces. But if you zoom in in those provinces, you see different villages and then yeah. within villages you can also say yeah. well that is behind the railroad so that yeah, is an right. entirely different culture from ours and yeah. uh, so, and, so and, they and occur actually, on so many levels and actually going into the history of europe for a moment uh european place names so many place names have some version of uh over the river beyond the river there's like all the i mean you'd have to uh, again i don't like talking about Holland. I certainly don't like talking about <laughs> Dutch as a language because uh, I, I don't feel um, confident or capable enough to. Uh, but I'm sure if you were to look at a map of Holland and found the number of words that have some kind of geographic marker of distinction, mm. Mm -hmm. usually with rivers, right? Something over the river. Yeah. Um, it's, so that's exactly this. Mm. And trains actually uh, added to this, right? Yeah. The train tracks mm. as a thing that someone's over the tracks. But, but yes, of course, culturally, that's everywhere. But even legally... Right? And mm. the legal distinctions are ones you don't notice. 
until the state tightens, which is what happened with COVID. Suddenly, yeah. you'd start, if they were to want to, if things got really bad, you'd start to see borders in, for example, around Brabant. And you'd start to see buffer areas between, for example, if you were to go from Amsterdam down to cross into Belgium, if you were to want to, that road, as you got closer to a national border, would have more checkpoints. It would start to tighten. And the checkpoints, unimaginable right now. But that's partially because corona, while it's terrifying, I mean, it's not the plague, right? It isn't of, an, of a yeah. level of extremeness that it could be. It wouldn't shock anybody if suddenly it wasn't even the, the national border. You start to see all these kinds of tightenings because the legal distinctions exist between jurisdictions yeah. and regions. Yeah. And we only think of them basically once every couple of years for elections when you realize whose district someone is in yeah. where, which gets back to gerrymandering. Yeah. There are moments of visibility. Yeah, interesting. Um, another thing I would like to highlight, uh, uh, since we are talking about this, is something more about Volt. Uh, we are a European movement where everybody that wants to participate, to have a meaningful contribution to democracy or to their society, can use Volt in order to have that contribution. And so we are an organization that's flat, that believes in distributed leadership, and where's, where there's a lot of room for initiative. One of those initiatives is a petition that has started to end the closing of a border in Belgium, Luxembourg, Germany. In that area, we've seen that due to COVID, borders have been closed down. And citizens that live on those borders and work on the other sides actually have uh, yeah. occur with a lot of trouble. Yeah, um, their livelihoods are cut in half. Exactly, yeah. their livelihoods are, are cut in half. So um, this petition has started and together with people that live in that region, we try to put pressure on the governments to open the borders. Why? Not only because livelihoods are cut in half, but also because so far research shows that it is not an effective measure to prevent the spread of COVID-19. It's way more focused on regions uh, and not necessarily along state lines. Yeah. So it doesn't even have a positive effect. Right. And uh, that's something I wanted to highlight. So if you go to openpetition.eu, yeah. you can uh, find that. Uh, and uh, I also wanted to give a shout out for the people in Belgium, Luxembourg, Germany, from Volt that are working on this. Uh, keep up the good work and let's hope that we can make sure that the border is opened as soon as possible. Yeah. Right. yeah. So going back then to... Um, Again, to your book, to your uh, approach by this, how do you call it? This this co um, co bordering. Uh, the co bordering. Yeah. Um, would that apply then also to manage this uh, COVID nineteen crisis now for uh, Europe? And uh, should the countries have been uh, doing actions more than together? And um, because yeah, that's I know, even though your own yeah. sovereignty, you know, your yeah. own policy tools might stop at this diffuse zone we call a border um, because you call in your book for more co-bordering yeah well or yeah or at least the um, learning about what co-bordering is so we can start to manage it you know my fear just just to, to put that um, uh, precisely my fear is actually that co-bordering if we don't start to think about and regulate it will end up becoming a new way in which all the undesirables yeah, okay. are filtered and so I actually am a little bit scared about, I wouldn't say I'm in favor of co-bordering. What I would say is it's happening. It's now the task of the critical thinking community and the thoughtful readerships and listenerships and the politicians and everyone to start to think about what to do about this fact that exists. Uh, frankly, co-bordering terrifies me because if you're concerned at all about, for example, think of like refugees right, or migrants who are in a way society's most vulnerable the question of states becoming more efficient in the ways they manage the flow of the most vulnerable people isn't obviously good, right? <laughs> depending on what the state does with it. And, you know, I have a lot of faith, actually, in the Dutch government. I would have less faith in my government to uh, use this incredible power uh, in a way that's, you know, just, right? Yeah. And, um, but frankly, the fear is that all states with that power would abuse it, actually. I shouldn't be so glib, right? It's actually frankly true for all states. But um, my, uh, the way I put it in the book, that I still, the way I conceptualize it, I try to think about it, is to say that I think that we had different periods of what sort of a border meant. 
And in particular, we think of the border through this idea of sovereignty, uh, which we call the Westphalian concept, which is from the Treaty of Westphalia in, this, in the 1640s, which already is a little bit fictitious, what even states were in the 17th mm, century, yeah. but <clears throat> even without the specificity historically. Uh, the truth is, is that there was a time in which what a border meant is it was a place where a state would keep out another state with its armies, right? It's where the state met another state. And already in the 19th century, you started to get into this world where globalization and mobilization and mobility became more meaningful to states. So at the state's border, they cared less about, you know, your army, right? Army B coming into country A and more about people, regulating people. That wasn't always just migrants coming in. In the past, it was actually a lot of it was ta tax dodgers. Uh -huh. It was people with money yeah. coming out, right? Mm. But the idea that mm. the border went from being a place where a state met another state to becoming a place where a state stoppered mobility is already a 100, 200-year-old model. It's uh, the new thing, the new era, epoch we're in, that concerns me is that now states are realizing it's not about stopping your army or even stopping mobility. It's us as states ganging up together and using all the capacious powers of the state to stop mobility. And so there's a huge fear that this is just going to get states becoming ever stronger, aided by incredible technologies yeah. for distinction and division to basically beat up on the most vulnerable people. And so this is what so this is the general story of co-boarding that scares me without the right kinds of thinking and regulation and making sure that we don't end up becoming exclusionary, et cetera. To answer your question about COVID, COVID is the perfect opportunity, which I hope we don't waste, to yeah. think critically about how which borders are meaningful and why. And this point about how to stop a virus, which of course does not care at all about our stupid politics and our stupid no. national petty hatreds and all this crap. They, you know, the virus doesn't care whose football team you root for, right? Uh, the virus is the perfect moment to say, well, actually, certain kinds of border controls are totally irrational, totally useless, and just harm people's lives. Whereas others that ha might have nothing to do with national borders would be actually meaningful to assert as a protective measure. Yeah. And that would require getting, of course, exactly the warrant of this conversation, of course it requires getting out of our nation state shells and getting out of this incredibly yeah. silly, narrow-minded view yeah. of what a state yeah. container yeah. looks like, yeah. right? Which is where, of course, Volt would come in. Yeah. That's precisely yeah. the kind of thing yeah. that Volt could use to say, look, COVID yeah. proves yeah. the lie. So... Yeah. Um, we are now, if you're listening to this and you jump, dropped in later on Vunk Radio, an initiative by Volt. And everybody can ask questions to us via our YouTube channel. If you chat in YouTube, then you can ask us any questions. And there's also been some questions that have come in, especially Super. for you. Super. Um, a question by Fons Janssen, which I think taps in nicely to where you just ended, is what role does digit digitalization play when it comes to borders? Yeah, so the new border is a digital border. And I think there's two kinds of, that's a great question, and I'm glad that you asked it. Uh, there's two kinds of ways you can think about how to answer that question. Uh, the first kind of way is to say, well, the digital border is changing the border because now a border, which still exists as a physical place, is also a digital one, and it changes the way states behave at borders. For example, insofar as borders are places where people are filtered, Right? They're places where data, your digital stamp, can determine where you go. We know this in a familiar sense from mm. the passport and the visa. Not everybody can cross every border, even when we're not talking in, in COVID times. Right? So the idea of digitalization uh, already exists in a very banal sense, uh, but we also know it exists in a, in a greater sense. For example, how quick you can cross borders has a lot to do now with whether you have global entry passes. Okay, well, how do you get a global entry pass? It requires you have money, right? You have to pay for it. It already starts to exclude people based on economics. It is also based on whether or not you are cleared for security purposes. That determines, for example, uh, gets, or gets rid of lots of people who the state considers shady. Okay, based on what? There are value judgments that come in to that kind of story which is not a good thing per se. So for example, the more likely you are to have any cor correspondence with Muslim countries, the more likely that can be used against you. 
So the question of the digital border might just be the way the border in the 21st century adapts and becomes a more powerful tool of filtration. But the second question of the relationship of technology to the border that I think is scarier because we think less about it is the question of whether or not the border stops being something that ever has anything to do with borders per se or ends at border lines, but ultimately covers the whole polity. And the more borders become everywhere, the more scared we should be. You know, one of the things that was more terrifying about uh, the reaction to COVID is the idea that people can start to digitally or through thinking through digitally having tests of whether you are COVID clear, right? Whether you're either without COVID or you've already contracted and therefore are, are healthy as a permit, a digital pass you'd get to return to work. This is the kind of ways in which bordering exclusionary tactics aided by technology start to infiltrate all levels of society. So there's two very discrete aspects of that question. One could also argue, though, that, that it's a beautiful measure to make our uh, societies go a bit back to the way it was before, because it will enable you to, or, or it will enable us uh, to be able to keep track of who's ill and who's not, and with that controlling it more while being open, uh, while being able to open the economy. So that f that's a form of exclusion, but it might not necessarily be bad. Yeah, and I think that that's, that's, that's a helpful intervention. I think that one should always be asking. I don't think there's any uh, thing, per se, outside of very extreme things like you know, murder and that are uh, purely easy to answer. I think that all policies have shades and sides to it, of course. Uh, insofar as people's livelihoods depend on going back to work, it could be a tool. But you know, coming at it from the perspective I do, my concern is the tools abused. Right, so the fact that it could be a good tool, I totally agree, actually. I think you're totally right. And it, it would be great we live in a world in which it were to be the kind of tool that could be used. But the concern, or the, the way I approach it, is to ask, how would this be abused? It's very easy to see how more data tracking devices could be used by states. Because you can always ask the question of who is excluded and why? Who is the excluder? Who decides? Right? And so, for example, it wouldn't be surprising at all. Imagine they started to monetize tests. Imagine it costs something to get a test. So then who gets cleared? People who can afford the test. Right? Those kinds of questions. Uh, that's what global entry is. Right? I mean, that, that, that yeah. kind of model, it's a, it's a pay for freedom. You pay something for a kind of liberty, which, frankly, most of us think you should yeah. just have. Right? It shouldn't be a thing you pay for. So I would be worried about the ways in which that transformed. Even if as a principle, no, I think you're totally right. If it's a way to get people back to work, that's the best thing. Thanks. Interesting. Yes. Interesting. Uh, I have maybe a, a question for you. Um, uh, when, when we talked about the state borders in the U.S., um, Americans do have American nationality. I mean, that is something that binds them. Now, we talked about the borders here within Europe. Mm. Uh, I think from the Volt uh, viewpoint, uh, we would like to maybe uh, seek European citizenship, mm. citizenry. In your mind, would that be a desirable thing uh, for Europe uh, to, to, to have that as a goal? Is it feasible? Uh, what would be needed uh, to, what steps do we need to take to come to that? Yeah, terrific. So I think that um, citizenship questions, like any kind of uh, rights question, uh, the way I approach it, and this is the uh, particularity of coming at this from the academic angle, not the state angle, right, uh, is just a question of how the citizenship process would be engendered. So for example, uh, you could imagine a fully inclusive European citizenship that is actually a terrific thing. The kind of citizenship that actually, you know, gets rid of some of the distinctions about being from a uh, more fancy Western European country and with a big economy and et cetera, and a less fancy, less strong economy in Europe. There's a way that the idea of European citizenship, like any kind of increasingly federal model, right, where sovereignty is increasingly uh, relinquished, in other words, uh, yeah. moving towards the direction of either a federated model like the US yeah. or even just a polity, right? Like a unified polity. There's something beautiful about that insofar as it would enable a certain kind of uh, inclusiveness that gets rid of those distinctions. An example here would be that with uh, in the case of the US, 
until you meet a person, but legally the distinction, you wouldn't even know if someone's from, I don't know, no. Mississippi, let's say, a state right. that is a, a, yeah. a weaker economic state yeah. or a more powerful one. You literally wouldn't know. No. And the idea of that aspect of citizenship as being uh, uh, able to almost rub off the ugly edges of nationalism and the ugly edges of, of right. inter-European kinds of exclusionary politics is a beautiful thing. Right. But yeah, whenever you start creating some kind of law, you always wonder about whether you erase some edges and you make new ones, yeah. right? And so without yeah. knowing the specifics of how yeah. that gets yeah. done, yeah. right? Uh, to use the global entry, I do not think this is necessarily the same subject at all, right? Mm -hmm. But to use the global entry question, uh, it would matter whether or not, for example, uh, new European passports would have to be paid for, right? <laughs> yeah. No, I'm, I'm asking, right? Yeah. Like the question yeah. of yeah. whether or not there are ways in which European becomes a priv privileged status, not a just by dint of birth status, is a political issue, right? That's an issue right. of how you would yeah. design the model, yeah. not knowing anything about the ways yeah. in which this, and I don't exist in a European politics per se, right? Uh, I would have no insight and I have no idea, yeah. but that would be the shadow of it. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Thank so you. So we you. actually get an, a, a couple of extra questions coming okay. in and we are almost nearing the end as well. Okay. So I think we have another uh, five to seven minutes before we play some music and then uh, go to the next item. Okay. Um, we talked about a quiz that is coming up later today and you jokingly said, I hope that I do not get quizzed. Well, I have one quiz question uh -oh. for you and then I'll move on to questions that came on, on the YouTube channel. What uh, uh, is the point, point in the world where you can stand in most countries at once? Where is it and how many borders touch there? Oh, how that's many really countries? fascinating. So, uh, okay, so to give, to, to give the, the context a little bit for the listener, uh, state borders, obviously, if you're on a border, you touch two countries. Square borders or tripartite borders is quite common for three states to come together at a point. Uh, I know at least uh, a classic example of four states coming together is uh, China, Mongolia, Kazakhstan, Russia has a double river, like a... Um, an X border where four states come together. Is there an example of five? I don't know. As far as uh, Google t teaches me, no, there is not at the moment. There has been one in the past. And there is a uh, quadri point, as okay. it's called, where four borders meet. And um, well, one is also in Africa, where Botswana, Namibia, Zambia, yeah. and Zimbabwe meet. Oh, um, so, uh, sorry for tricking you into a quiz. <laughs> That's okay. Um, no, it's all right. Back to the uh, questions from the YouTube channel. channel. There's actually uh, two. Um, one is more concerned about borders, and the other one is about a Euro European army. Okay. Do you, Matthew, think there should be a Euro European army? Since it's not your specialty, I, c I would ask you to briefly answer that, and then I will as ask the question from... Trin Truhong, I'm not sure if I pronounce it right, if not, sorry, uh, about um, borders. Yeah, wow. Uh, well, I think the European army question is ultimately, in my view, the same as the are we one polity question. Because in a sense, I think there's something uh, terrifically inefficient about uh, European states having separate national armies. I, I respect the inefficiency. Uh, but as someone who's a little bit concerned about power ever getting bigger... The idea of a very, very powerful polity like the EU, that is a ton of money and a ton of people, having a consolidated killing force uh, isn't the first thing I would advocate for. So in a way, there's something nice about the inefficiency of Europe's petty nationalisms getting in the way of making an ever more perfect killing machine. Uh, maybe that's not what the question was hoping I would say. Uh, but yeah, there's something nice when when devastating technologies of... of death are inefficient yeah so maybe yeah. not <laughs> thank you for that question samuel <laughs> ara uh, and thanks for your answer uh, matthew um then back to the uh, other question which is some of the most striking examples of co-bordering in today's world coincide with physical borders how can we prevent non-physical co-bordering in the wake of covid across unconnected borders Wow, that's a terrific question. I, um, 
Yeah, I think that in general, the subject of, of, of unconnected polities, we are increasingly seeing a uh, digital kind of, of bordering community growing around the world. And uh, the fact of co-bordering as a delocated topic is real. You know, one of the uh, uh, chapters in my book, and I actually later wrote it as an article, uh, is about the idea of the digital firewall, that a firewall is a way mm. in which digital communities create boundaries or abilities to manage flows, right? Uh, having nothing to do with territoriality. In this case, there are lots of kinds of connectivity, certainly between, uh, you know, Europe and the US, for example, like tons of different kinds of information sharing uh, channels and networks. And in a way, my attitude, and maybe this is a little bit um, uh, less utopian than would be attractive, but my reality is to say, this stuff happens, it exists. The question is how you use the fact of its existing as a platform to think critically about it, about whether or not we can shape it in a way that's more uh, just or more attractive or more desirable. And, uh, but therefore the sheer fact of it, all I can say is uh, the more I do research, the more I know that the warrant of your question is the right one. Co-bordering is in fact a delocated phenomenon and whether or not COVID teaches us this, I actually think COVID teaches us a lot. Mm. Um, and uh, maybe COVID will allow us to think about these kind of communities, again, make visible these communities, um, uh, which would be terrific, right? It'd be terrific to say, maybe COVID alerts us to ways in which there are uh, invisible lines, invisible networks of border communities where people are... Uh, more tolerated or less tolerated based on what kind of data you have, what kind of data profile you have, if that becomes visible, it becomes a thing we can critique. So in that sense, COVID might be a terrific opportunity. And we're going to see this come down back to the subject about whether or not there's sort of like a, a health rating, a safety rating that we start to institute. Insofar as that's true, uh, who gets deemed healthy? Right? The question of borders closing in a way isn't that interesting. It's when they reopen, what do they look like? Mm. And imagine we start to say, to give a, a hypothetical, uh, I really, I'm, you know, I'm country A. I really trust the people of country B. So when they say their citizens are healthy, let them in. But country C, I don't trust their data. I don't trust them. So even if they say they're healthy, don't let them in. That sounds totally prudent from the standpoint of health. But if then I told you that country A is, you know, Christian and white and rich, and country B is, you know, non-Christian, non-white and non-rich, you'd have to ask yourself, is it that we're trusting them because they're healthy, or is it that we're distrusting others because we don't want them in our country? And insofar as that's the question, COVID is giving us a really nice platform to ask it, right? <laughs> so whether we do is up to us. Yeah. But yeah, the platform is... It's in front of us. This is the new world. Thank you very much, uh, okay. Matthew. Um, our hour flew, uh, <laughs> so yeah, we're, um, we're nice nearing the end. And I just want to say that uh, if you consider yourself a border geek as well, or you just <laughs> found this a really interesting conversation, I would advise you to buy the book of oh, Matthew, yes. which is called The Politics <laughs> of Borders. So I'm, I'm just assuming that you are too modest to uh, promote it yourself. So that's why I'm doing it again. That was the kind of The Politics you. of Borders by Matthew Longo. Uh, buy that book and thank you very much uh, yeah. for being here is there anything you would like to finish off with or a last uh, statement that you would like to give to our listeners no except this was really interesting for me as well and I will say that Volt is really a fascinating uh, project and, there, and therefore as a person in the border geekery world uh, it's nice to say you would follow me and the stuff I work on also know that I will be following you thank so you wonderful. very much thank you thank you Matthew thank you